half in the bag. I just shit in a coffee can. Hello and welcome to Half in the Bag. I'm Jay. Uh -huh. And we just saw two things that were recently released into theaters that the studio is telling us are movies. That's right, Jay. The films we saw this week are White House Down and The Lone Ranger. White House Down is the new film from acclaimed director Roland Emmerich, the cinematic genius behind such films as The Patriot, Independence Day, Godzilla, The Day After Tomorrow, and 2012, one of my personal favorites. In this film, Magic Mike and Jamie Foxx pretend to be characters in a movie that is about as plausible as a Roland Emmerich film. Jamie Foxx plays President James Washington, the President of the United States. The White House gets blowed up. And Magic Mike protects him by shooting the bad guys with his gun. Also, his little daughter is in danger. And he wants to prove that he's a good father. Has this plot been done before? I don't think so. Thanks, Roland Emmerich. I hope someone shoves a club up your ass. <laughs> Uh, this is probably the most enjoyable Roland Emmerich movie I've ever seen, which is saying very little, because I've hated pretty much all of his movies. I didn't see a couple of them, um, but I'll get right on that. Mm. But uh, the first two-thirds of this movie or so, kind of, the, the Roland Emmerichness seemed to be scaled back a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's still some of the dumb tropes, like the, the father whose daughter is mad at him because he doesn't pay attention to her and all that stuff, but... The father-daughter uh, relationship I really could uh, see. I... There wasn't the really bad, out-of-place humor and the, the pandering and schmaltz that his movies have until the end, and then it gets horrible. Yeah. Um, but there's some action that I thought was kind of fun. There's only one sequence in the whole movie that I felt sort of felt appropriate for a premise like this, which is there's an extended car chase scene on the White House lawn, and the president has a rocket launcher, and that's like, okay, it's getting goofy now. Uh, but it's just that one scene, and then the rest of it's pretty bland and uh, bloodless and crappy. Yeah, I, I think the car chase scene was the one moment in this movie where it, it became goofy and self-aware, and I, I actually laughed out loud. Yeah, that felt more of like a like an older action movie, like an 80s or early 90s well, action movie. Well, that's the thing. I'm glad you mentioned 80s or 90s action movie because I actually saw Olympus Has Fallen, mm. which is basically the identical movie. Um, and that movie was dumb. This movie's dumb. They're both dumb in their own ways, but Olympus Has Fallen is, is 80s action movie dumb. It's like Rambo movie dumb. Oh, really? Yeah, and, and it's really good, actually. There's, there's more realistic violence. Like, at one point, he says, I'm going to stab you in the brain. <laughs> and um, he's, I'm going to stab you in the brain. That's an actual line That's in the movie? That's an actual line in That's the movie. That's great. And then at the end, he does indeed stab him in the brain. Spoilers. Wow. Um, but it was a little more gritty, more realistic. This movie was, um, it, it almost felt like a, like a Mel Brooks comedy. <laughs> like, it felt like a, like, a, like a naked gun movie mm -hmm. at times. Like the way, like the way it was filmed and just the look of it. That's funny that you mentioned Naked Gun because I was thinking, uh, uh, spoiler, James Woods is a bad guy in this movie. Uh, he's one of the first of many predictable uh, plot twists uh, mm -hmm. as far as the characters. But during his scenes, I was thinking, and I like James Woods, I think he's a good actor, but I was like, he comes off comical in this role. And I was thinking of like, it's the same as putting like Leslie Nielsen in that part. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that during the movie. I was like, you could put Leslie Nielsen in this movie. It'd have the same, inf same effect. Yeah. There's there's actual an actual line of dialogue at the end of this movie that made me laugh out loud. Mm -hmm. It's not the line where um, Maggie Gyllenhaal uh, says to the president, "Mr. President, China, Russia, India, all the nations on, of the world just called, and they love your peace plan." <laughs> <laughs> That's like an actual line of dialogue. Like, yeah. China just called. They yeah. love your peace plan, and they vow to have world peace. <laughs> but there's a line where um, 
uh, Channing Tatum is running around and, and she's like, you have 10 minutes to turn off the nuclear arms codes or World War III starts. Yeah. Like verbatim, like, like literal World War III is going to start. Well, that's so she's the people speaking... in the audience go, oh, it's bad. Yeah, she's not speaking metaphorically. Right. It's literal. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, there's no subtlety or <laughs> there's no subtlety in this movie. Yeah. Every, everything is like that. Yeah. The, the movie kind of like the premise of the movie was just so, so stupid and unrealistic <laughs> that um, it, it reminded me of just like like a a very, very low IQ security guard sitting somewhere like watching the door at a, a, a Walmart. And, and that's his fantasy. <laughs> I'm gonna be a, a secret agent and uh, I save the president when people come and try to blow up the White House. And like that was portrayed as reality in this movie. And I was like, okay, well, take it over the limit, turn it into a complete comical farce or, or don't. Get your hands off my joints. It's, it almost just makes you tired. I, I feel like I've just been beaten. Yeah. And I'm lying on the floor, and Hollywood movies just keep punching me in the face. And it won't, you just keep going like this. Stop, <laughs> stop. And, and they just keep punching you. And then at some point, you just die. Again, this is a developing story. There has been an explosion. Absolutely shocking. It's now OK to make a movie where the US Capitol blows up and the White House blows up and we see panic and chaos like 9-11. No one's gonna yell too soon because yeah. it's now been over a decade. Yeah. So who's got a White House Die Hard script? <laughs> I know there's a hundred of them out there. Die Hard in the White House, who's got them? And then they find them and what was this, the magic year where? It just happened. Well, it's happened before in movies. You have Armageddon and Deep Impact and yeah. there's those two volcano movies. There's ants and a bug's life like it just happens i think it's coincidence is it's it coincidence weird, or are there hollywood spies that go so and so's making this let's make this before they make that I, I don't know i can't confirm that the only case i can confirm of that is being uh when golan globus split up mm. when canon films split up they both went off and made their own uh uh lombada films what Ow! Can you not hit me in the head with a rocket while I'm trying to drive? So Jay, let's talk about the plot to this movie. Okay. And um, uh, let's specifically let's talk about the politics of this plot. Um, who are the villains in this movie? Uh, uh, old white men. That's right. Because we don't want to offend anybody, so old white men you're safe with, even yeah. though it, it creates a complete lack of interest in anything that's happening when. Every villain in every movie is an old white guy now. Uh, uh, crazed right-wing nutjobs who go as far up as the Speaker of the House mm. have, a, have a dastardly plan, and he has a magical treaty that will create world peace. Oh, yeah, just like that. It's, uh, he, 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 he met with the president of Iran and shook his hand, and the president of Iran said, let's sign a magic tre <laughs> uh, peace treaty that will create <laughs> world peace. And um, the, the crazed right-wingers don't want that because the, the military-industrial complex, which makes billions of dollars off war, uh, will lose money. So uh, the, the Speaker of the House is willing to nuke the White House <laughs> and, uh, and create a, a nuclear war and blow up all of the Middle East to keep money flowing into the military-industrial complex. Yes. Which is completely plausible. But it, well, I, I, you know, I was with the movie at this point. Yeah. Still. Oh, this is so stupid. You mean Mr. President? Go, 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 go. Let's just call SEAL Team Six, and they come in here to get us. We have a scramble sat phone in the residence. Great. Where's that at? Oh, of course it is. By the way, John Cale. Same story. Someone says, write a script about Die Hard in the White House. You go, okay. Ah. Yeah. Well. You have to have the, the down on his luck security guard who gets caught up in everything, a la John McClane. You have to, um, and then you have to have a really good reason for someone to try to take over the White House, terrorists or uh, whoever. Yeah. Uh, no one in their right mind is gonna try to pull that off for a bunch of money, like, like Hans Gruber. Right. Uh, some random building in Los Angeles, maybe. The White House, no. Second you get in, you're fucked, you know? Like, you're fucked. You're not gonna get out of there alive. So you have to have a really good reason. You have to be a crazy person who wants to try to get uh, nuclear launch codes to just to blow up the world because you're nuts. 
Um, and if you're that nuts, no one's going to follow you. That's why I was like just scratching my head going, all, the, all these guys, I guess they, they labeled them as racists and uh, uh, home militant nut jobs that, that love the Ku Klux Klan and hate the president. So that's why they would do that. But really, like, I say, like, I'm going to go hire a bunch of uh, military guys to come help me. What's the job? Well, it pays really well. What's the job? Uh, we're going to storm the White House. But you're going to get paid really well <laughs> once, once, once they give us our ransom and let us walk away. All, all I remember, is speaking of them being fucked, is the, one of the, the secondary bad guys shoots and kills somebody, and the little daughter says, you're going to jail for that. And I was thinking, for that? So, the, so you have James Woods, who's crazy, and a bunch of other crazy guys, and then, and then. Well, he has a brain tumor too. He has a brain tumor, which is pressing on his frontal cortex, which yeah. is making him do irrational things, but also smart enough to pull off a, a job like this. And then the the computer genius guy is also a little off. Um, so, a rational computer genius guy would go, "No, no thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not that dumb." The most inept. Insane people in the world are able to take over the White House. And <laughs> the only hook that it has is you're seeing the White House be destroyed. That's pretty much it. You might as well not even have a plot. Just show that. Is it disaster porn? It's disaster porn. It's all of Roland Emmerich's movies are like that. Yeah. He, he loves seeing the White House be destroyed so much that he's going to give himself a little pat on the back in this movie about the fact that he's done it before. They have a reference to Independence Day in this movie. I think the uh, FBI should come knocking on those doors. Mm, he might be Sir, up to something. We have some questions about the films you're making. So let's talk about performances. Okay. Channing Tatum's in it. And come see the movie in theaters June 28th. All right, we're done talking about performances. Let's move on. When did Maggie Gyllenhaal start looking like an elderly woman? I, I noticed that. Um, Especially like her first scene when she's doing the interview with him and she just has these like giant bags under her she, eyes. She has, she has like um, crease lines on her face yeah, for some reason. Yeah, well I, she, she's always looked kind of like a sad turtle. Oh, and yeah. in this movie, she just looks older than she is. Yeah, yeah. She looks like she's James Woods' age. She's very poor lighting. Um, and, and she has a lot of wrinkles on her face from saying Gyllenhaal <laughs> all the time. What's your name? Maggie Gyllenhaal. <laughs> what do you think about that Richard Jenkins? I like Richard Jenkins. I've always liked Richard Jenkins. Yes. He's a good actor. He deserves better than this. I, I thought, as does James Woods. I thought um, Richard Jenkins uh, was going to be like a, a, a character that redeemed himself in the end. Mm. He's a little shy, awkward, Speaker yeah. of the House character. and. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, he just becomes like a comical. He's like a mustache twirling yeah, villain. Yeah. He, he, as they're dragging him away, he's like, "You'll never get me." Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's so bad. And um, even like the the White House is still on fire. It's like five <laughs> feet from them. Uh, Channing Tatum is wounded and mortally wounded and bleeding, and he's just like, "You're the one who's the bad guy. Let's call your pager number." You can't prove a thing. I'll get you yet. <laughs> so, Mike, would you recommend White House is Falling? White House is Falling. Uh, no. No. I, uh, I feel redundant saying it's dumb. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. That's not true. Uh, it might be. No. I, I just feel tired at this point. The best thing I can say about this movie, and maybe this is why I would say it was the most enjoyable Roland Emmerich movie I've seen, is that the disaster porn is sort of located, it's centered on just one place. It was cool for me because it was only in one place. Mm -hmm. I had never really done that. Instead of globally, where we see everything blow up. That, that sort of confines it a bit in a way that makes it feel a little more restrained than his other movies. It's great to have a person who allows you to bring in your voice and bring in your ideas. And, and these poor actors in yeah. this movie, I mean, sure they're getting paid, but it's, it's like we're the butt of a joke. <laughs> and everyone that, that's making this movie is just in on a joke. Just laughing all the way to the bank? Yeah. This movie is a huge spectacle. 
unbelievable. A helicopter and tons of people and things on fire. And I mean, it's pretty amazing. Basically just saying a bunch of bullshit. Sure. And, um, you know, you're getting paid. And I, I get that. But, you know, they're all just laughing at us. <laughs> yeah. And then they're like, all the dumb flyover people, the dumb fat cows eating popcorn will all eat this up. And they're just laughing at well, us. I wonder about Roland Emmerich's motivation. Is that it? Um, I, um, I actually was... Um... Is he doing this completely cynically and just laughing? Or does he think that he, this is like... Does he think of himself as like a Spiel, like early Spielberg? Like, I'm making broad entertainment for a wide audience that everyone can enjoy. Like, what, what do you think his motivation is? Roland Emmerich, the world's greatest con artist or delusional auteur? You decide. So, Jay, did you see any other movies? Oh, yeah. I actually just saw Before Midnight, which is the Richard Linklater film. It's, of course, the third in a, a series of movies he's been doing over the course of almost 20 years now, which is a really sort of interesting experiment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I went to a revival screening, a little independent art house theater of uh, Truffaut's The 400 Blows. Oh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant film. That's funny that you should say revival screenings, because I went to a screening of Hearts of Darkness, which oh. is, of course, the documentary about the making of Francis Ford Coppola's yeah. Apocalypse Now. Yes. Brilliant documentary. Documentary, yeah, brilliant! Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing to see the process and and the breakdown, you know, and everything that went into making that brilliant, brilliant film. Yeah, I'm glad with all these other screenings we're going to that we still had time to see the Lone Ranger. Eight men rode into canyons. I dug seven graves. The men you seek think you are dead. Better to stay that way. You want me to wear a mask? Justice is what a man must take for himself. The Lone Ranger is the new film from a bunch of people who got together and said, let's make an old idea new again, put Johnny Depp in it, and laugh all the way to the bank. These people are now unemployed. The film stars Arm and Hammer as the Lone Ranger, and Johnny Depp as another one of his eccentric characters who wears a stupid hat. So, Mike, what did you think of the Lone Ranger? Uh, yeah. I, I fell asleep during it, actually, during several segments. Really? I did. I'm afraid I have to take you in. Do you hear, Do you hear me? Would you call this movie a mess? It's almost a mess. It's not quite, but it definitely has tone issues. Well, well, here's the thing, okay. Um, the talk of the town is that The Lone Ranger is a big ass flop. Uh, it only took in $19 million on its opening weekend and it cost um, $270 billion to make. And um, it's, uh, I think it's helping to bankrupt Disney. You want me to wear a mask? There'll come a time when good man must wear masks. What went wrong? Jay, what is wrong with the Lone Ranger? Everybody wants to know. Uh, well, I think the biggest thing is that nobody gives a fuck about the Lone Ranger. I think that would be the biggest thing. Well, There's a, a, a complete lack of interest in a Lone Ranger movie. Th well, there was a complete lack of interest in a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Well, th that was something that was completely out of nowhere, though. Uh, the Lone Ranger's been around. Nobody cares anymore. Um, it's not one of those things that you can revive, like, you know, the, the comic book movies or uh, uh, what's something else they bring back, like horror franchises, like make a new Nightmare on Elm Street movie, make a new fr uh, Friday the 13th movie. Well, I think Nobody's the... interested in a new Lone Ranger movie. No, but nobody was interested in a Pirates of the Caribbean movie either. That's something where you go, like, what? Mm. Like, but, but it's the fact that the movie works. So setting that aside, Lone Ranger, yeah. When was the hell was that on TV? 1930? <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> the Lone Ranger! Like, it's so antiquated, it's so out of date, and, and you can even, like, it's, it's, it's almost like, don't touch it, because you got a guy as an Indian running around, and it's like, yeah, you know. Them angry because white men talk with two tongues. So, it's not that. Mm. It's, wh what's wrong with the movie? You can, you can take some old crappy idea, put a, a, a twist on it and make it work. Why didn't this movie work for you? Um, well, uh, a big part of it is the fact that it's tonally all over the place. Uh, 
there's, I, I don't know, it starts off entertaining enough. It's sort of lighthearted and, and then halfway through there's, they get on a train and it goes on for an hour with them on this train and it's all serious and there's double crosses and drama and whatever. And they get off the train and there's all this stuff with uh, uh, the army fighting the Native American tribe and it's just people like brutally, violently murdering each other uh, with arrows and rifles and it's horribly like depressing and, it's, and you're watching it and you're saying, I thought this was supposed to be fun. And then, and then it gets wacky and goofy and it brings the old Lone Ranger theme back for the end. And you're like, well, how did we get here now? So I think that's it. It's sort of like whiplash. You're all over the place uh, on what I think you're supposed to be feeling emotionally. And, and that sequence, that whole train sequence where they have that song playing, and I guess we should say this is the climax of the movie. It's a fun scene. There's two trains. They're on tracks right next to each other. There's lots of jumping back and forth from one to the other. There's a, a ladder that's being swung around, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's got the classic uh, Lone Ranger music playing, but that's the only time in the movie that that plays. And it comes after 45 minutes of, of bad drama and, and slaughter and war. And you're like, what am I supposed to be feeling here? It's a fun scene, but it, it lacks any uh, emotion. Yeah. Really. It, it, it lacks any, any heroism, any excitement. Because we're trying to stop an old man from taking a bunch of uh, silver that he mined uh, and making $65 million with it and becoming the head of his own corporation. Yeah. Like, that's, that's what we're trying to stop. And it's like that, and, and even Star Trek Into Darkness, it was a crazed admiral who was power hungry, who wanted to militarize the Starfleet for his own evil purposes, and it was an inside thing. Yeah. It, we, we can't have a bad guy. It, it has to be cynical. You can't wave the American flag because that's patriotic and corny. I was more interested in the, the sub-bad guy who they established earlier in the movie as being the bad guy. Yeah. He's creepy, he's dirty, he's a fucking cannibal for some reason, which is really dark and weird for a movie like this. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're given uh, sufficient motivation to dislike him and want to see the Lone Ranger defeat him. Mm -hmm. The guy ate his brother's fucking heart. Which happens in the movie, by the way. A character gets uh, a knife shoved into his chest and his heart dug out and, and eaten. All I know is that a man killed my brother. If we ride together, we ride for justice. Justice is what I seek. Well, let's continue talking about the, the cynicism of the way the source material is treated in this. Uh, as I mentioned, the Lone Ranger, for the most part, is sort of like a bumbling buffoon. He's treated as a joke. Uh, Tonto is no longer the, the loyal, you know, uh, proud Native American. He's a crazy person that's uh, maybe lying about everything throughout the whole movie. And then the whole movie is told in flashbacks and the wraparound to it is him as like a carnival freak show attraction. Like that's his fate. Something very wrong with that horse. There's that elderly woman that was in front of us in the screening of this. And then when the Lone Ranger theme came on at the end, she was like, because she recognized something from being a teenager. There, well, there was an elderly woman with dementia, uh, or, or she had some sort of problem with her, but she started clapping. Oh yeah. At, at, at the movie, and, and everyone's like, what? Oh, you have emotions? <laughs> We're just here to be bombarded with picture and sound mm. for two hours and then leave. Oh, movies make you feel something? <laughs> what, what is this lady from? past? <laughs> oh yeah, she's 105 years old. Ma'am, do you remember a time when movies made you feel something? Oh yes. I watched Humphrey Bogart and Clark Gable back in the pic. Did you feel something? What was that like? So yeah, who you think is the main villain in the movie is a cannibal, which is pretty bizarre for a Disney film. Uh, he's referred to by Johnny Depp as Tonto, as the, the Wendigo, which is like a Native American uh, a monster that eats people or something like that. So yes. they keep saying Wendigo in the movie a lot. So every time he said Wendigo, I kept thinking of one of my favorite films of all time, Bound by Blood, Wendigo. The warning was the potential of being possessed by an evil spirit. The Wendigo, it was called. 
Once possessed, the human host would supposedly become violent and obsessed with eating flesh. Uh, which, is, which is a wonderful film released by uh, Killer Wolf Films. Oh yes, director Len Kavazinski, who is my favorite filmmaker. You've done a good job here for the most part. I, I did what you told me to. You're right, you have. I don't believe involving the local authorities was part of our deal, though. Yes, uh, of, of also my favorite filmmaker. Oh, Len, what a coincidence. Len Kabazinski Kab, Jr. Well, sir, we're just going to have to ask you. What do we do when we make a Lone Ranger feature? Well, the first thing they do is they come up with the checklist. You got to put uh, Tonto, I.O. Silver, uh, the, the classic Lone Ranger theme. Uh, put all these things in there. And then you give that little notepad with the checklist to the writer, and he goes, what? Mm -hmm. And then he just comes up with some dumb plot about revenge and profits. But what do you do about the Tonto character? You just cast Johnny Depp, because everybody loves him, and he can get away with anything. Everybody loves Johnny Depp, and he's played a whole bunch of different characters with wacky makeup and costumes on. So. Yeah. He's the least likely to offend, mm -hmm. especially if you put Indian war paint on him. That's, that's uh, 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 race-neutral mm. Indian war paint, which is just black and white smeared. Because you can't go brown face. Yeah. But Johnny Depp, he can't be a Native American, and we cannot cast one. Yeah. So you're left with this conflict. And then to, to further distance ourselves from the, the material, we'll make him a crazy person. Yeah. He's not just a, a, a noble A noble Native, Native American who's working with uh, a, a lone ranger to, to solve crimes or to right the wrongs yeah. or perform justice. Or He'll whatever. also be the smarter of the two uh, to, to, to make it seem a little bit better that he's the sidekick. Yeah. He's really more of the hero. And the lone ranger is more of the sidekick, really. By the authority granted me by the state of Texas, I'm hereby arresting you. So how many of these movies have to flop before the studio starts to really panic and say, maybe we should try something new? Uh, I guess I would have to look at their, their bank account information to answer <laughs> that question, Jay. <laughs> As we stated before, the overseas markets are very important now, which is why uh, villains in all movies now are crazy Americans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially in political, realistic films like White House Down or anything in that genre. Um, it's our own military or our own insiders that have gone nuts. It's never an outside threat. Right. An outside threat is racist and offensive, and we, we especially China, we don't touch China. We love you, China. We recut our movies for China. We cast new actors and do f different versions of films. Like, where's the artistic integrity in that? Like, Jay, are you saying that Hollywood are a bunch of sellouts and traitors? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think especially right now, like with where super superhero movies are at and movies like this, like I think people want to see a hero. Like mm -hmm. I think people would want to see a a Superman that they can get behind and be like, yay, Superman, or, or any of these other characters. And we're, we're sort of denied of that. Everybody's yeah. mopey and whiny, or, or uh, they're not really the hero. And Things have to be dark or have a, a, a new twist or a new angle. Yeah, and there's certainly room for that with the right material. Sure. But not everything has to be that. Even though The Lone Ranger flopped, remaking another something similar to it is still a safer bet than putting $200 million in an unknown product. Mm -hmm. Well, where are we at with the Lone Ranger, Jay? Uh, don't bother seeing it. I guess nobody did, so it doesn't matter anyway. I'm glad that at the end they brought the Lone Ranger theme back because it's manipulative, but it sort of gave you the illusion that you're seeing something exciting. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's that it's that problem of them not wanting to go for anything. And I, I think that's